Okay, so um, my name is Justin. You may have seen me. I'm uh, one of the accidentals here. I run a company called uh, Duo, and what we do is uh, work on a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, which is not run by any operator. So it's run by its users in a decentralized fashion. So it's an example of one of these uh, decentralized networks, which I've I'm now extremely passionate about ever since I discovered Bitcoin in 2013. And um, really, it's a very exciting space to be in because there has been a lot of innovation and it's only picking up. It's kind of growing exponentially, almost. Um, it all started with BitTorrent in 2001, kind of the grandfather of the idea that we don't have to use the server client model. Instead, we can have um, peer to peer nodes talking to each other. and and provide value. Um, from, for the purpose of this talk, uh, Bitcoin 2008, that was a big revolutionary moment where um, Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, effectively discovered that nodes um, that don't know each other and don't trust each other can still agree on things. They can come to consensus. And then uh, five years later, we've had Ethereum, which was another breakthrough, but in a way, uh, much less of a breakthrough. It's just um, a generalization of Bitcoin and also learning from a lot of the mistakes that Bitcoin had made. So Ethereum, in a way, is what Bitcoin was, really, was meant to be, but um, never really became. And then, uh, interestingly, in 2014, we've had IPFS, which is a retake on BitTorrent. So it's BitTorrent on steroids. And again, um, they've learned all the mistakes that BitTorrent has made, and they've incorporated lots of cool technology um, that brings it up to date. And IPFS is actually the piece of technology upon which OpenBazaar is used, which is um, the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that I'm working on. So um, the stack kind of looks like that. Um, you have at the very first layer, uh, the transport layer, and a libp2p, which is um, a sub-project of IP IPFS, is really trying to do that in a, in a proper way, and I'll be talking about that. And then, um, slightly uh, one, one layer up, you have the, the consensus layer, or the trust layer, um, which is what Bitcoin has done extremely well. And I will talk about that. And then on top of the consensus layer, you have the state layer. And the consensus and the state layer together kind of form the, the blockchain layer. And the state layer basically keeps track of transactions and state changes and, and all that stuff, which is relevant for a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer application. And then you have peer-to-peer um, -peer storage which is what IPFS is doing. Um, and then the, the two last layers, which I'll probably not have time to talk about, are OpenBazaar, the application layer, and the services layer. One of the interesting things about this whole space is that we're seeing a decoupling of the application layer and the services layer. So applications tend to be these open source projects which are self-contained and autonomous um, and they tend to be what's called trustless. They just run uh, on their own. And the role for companies is now shifting away from building applications to building services that, are, that sit on top of the application layer. Okay, so the first layer is the transport one. And uh, the challenge there is to build a foundation for these peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, libp2p was designed specifically for IPFS, but it's starting to be used by other projects. And the goal is to take any two uh, um, nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer network and have them communicate directly in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Um, and when you do that, you kind of get this mesh network, which is the underlying network topology for all these, all these networks. Uh, but it turns out this is a very difficult problem because a lot of the internet protocols that we have nowadays aren't really designed for this kind of application. And there's a lot of um, device um, variety in the world. So you have 
um, Internet of Things devices, you have desktops, you have servers in the cloud, um, etc. And you also have lots of different network topologies and restrictions like NATs and firewalls, which makes it difficult. And um, browsers, which are one of the really uh, big um, target uh, pieces of technology, are especially difficult because they live in the, the, the client server paradigm, you know, making these HTTP requests. Um, and it's difficult to make them talk to each other in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So to give you a flavor of what um, libp2p has achieved from a, a technology standpoint, um, at the core, they use uh, a distributed hash table, which is basically a way for um, nodes in a, in a peer to peer network to store uh, transient pieces of information um, that could be useful at the current point in time. So anyone is free to add a piece of information or make a query for a specific key. Um, and what's stored in that DHT is a couple things. One is information related to the cryptographic identities because everything in these uh, networks is not based on, um, on legal identities like um, one, ones that companies have or even um, identities like, like DNS. It's kind of usually done using um, cryptographic identities which is um, done using public-private key cryptography. It could be RSA or ED25519 or something else. Um, and the, the identity mechanism is generally you, you take the hash of the public key and that's your identifier. And one of the things that's stored in, in this DHT is the actual public key. And the reason that's, that's kind of required if you want to communicate to your peer is uh, for the, the cryptography to work. You first need to know the public key so you can send them a message that only them can decrypt. Another piece of information stored in the DHT is um, routing information. So, for example, it could be an IP address in the TCP port, or it could be an IP address in the WebSocket port, or it could be um, something more sophisticated, like um, you first need to dial to this pair, and then this other pair, and then eventually we'll have a, a circuit or of, of relays that will be able to connect these two pairs. And um, yeah, so one of the, the, the tools that is used is kind of transport multiplexing. So for example, uh, browsers have a, a very limited range of transports. Like some, some modern browsers will support um, WebRTC um, and most, um, but, but not all of them. So sometimes you need to, to, to rely upon HTTP or, or WebSockets um, to, to communicate, but it's possible that the, the peer you're trying to communicate does not support WebSockets. They only support, I don't know, TCP or, 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 or UDP. So um, sometimes you need to use the, these relays and there's a negotiation uh, process where, where peers can, can basically find a route and also negotiate the um, the, the secure layer. So, so libp2p provides end-to-end -end encryption between the peers. So um, it's kind of similar to TLS, but without the um, certificate authority um, logic and, and baggage. So that's libp2p, um, the, the foundations. And then we have, on top of that, the consensus layer, which is uh, the big breakthrough, which um, kind of spiked the whole industry. And this diagram kind of um, depicts part of the blockchain. So the top part here is a se the sequence of what I call block headers. So blocks are just blobs of information and they have headers with especially important metadata. And then in the middle there, under the, the middle block, you have um, transactions and hashes of transactions. Now, for now, I'm kind of going to ignore these transactions and hashes of transactions because these form the, 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 that part of the, the state layer. 
or the transaction layer. And I'm going to focus on, on the headers. And really, the, the problem at hand that Bitcoin is trying to solve is um, what is the, the current version of reality? And um, in the case of Bitcoin, reality is subsumed in, in this Merkle root here. So there's a piece of cryptography which um, takes all, all sorts of transactions which may la lay at the bottom and hash them in a, in a binary tree uh, fashion such that um, the Merkle root, the root of the tree, uniquely encodes all the transactions or it's a unique fingerprint for all the transactions that are here. And the question is, how can people around the world agree on this Merkle root for the current point in time? And uh, the genius of, of Satoshi Nakamoto was to basically link the physical world, where there is kind of a, a notion of what the truth is, with the digital world. And the way that this link works is um, using electricity, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, so electricity is this, is this real world thing um, that you have to, to pay for if you want to use it. And uh, Satoshi uses electricity to produce these um, challenges um, or or more specifically, like challenges for, for work, which I've written the, 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 the formula here, if, if you're interested. So the idea is to uh, try and find these uh, nonces, um, kind of to try with brute force, um, such that if you take the header and you apply SHA-256, which is nothing more than a cryptographic hash, um, then that needs to be less than some sort of um, target. And where the, the target is adjusted so that is that adjusted using these timestamps so that on average you get one block every 10 minutes. Um, so w one thing to mention here is that um, this, 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 this chain of headers is cryptographically linked using um, what's called the previous hash here. So the previous hash is nothing more than the hash of the previous block. And so <coughs> if you were to um, change any, any bits, either in the transactions, which would change the Merkle root, or in, or in the header, that would change um, the previous hash, and that would make the, the, the proof of work um, invalid. So um, kind of the implicit rule for people who are burning electricity to find these nonces is um, whichever um, path in this tree of block headers has the most electricity expenditure attached to it is the version of reality. So here I've kind of shown a, a, sequ a sequence of of block headers, but in reality, what could happen, and does happen, is that um, there's that there's a fork. So <coughs> reality temporarily becomes kind of quantum, um, where it's kind of uncertain. It could be simultaneously in two states. Um, and the question is, how how do we collapse the state? And um, the the simple rule is, um, we'll just use whichever uh, branch of this tree has the most work associated with it. And it's kind of a funny um, self-fulfilling um, economic proposition whereby the, these, these, these miners um, will naturally be inclined to do what everything else is doing, like a, a bit like, like a herd of sheep. And that, that means that this, this rule is actually enforced from an economic standpoint. And the reason is that um, if, if you have a miner who is uh, working on the tip of 
of the wrong uh, branch of this tree, then he'd effectively be wasting electricity. And the reason is that if you do find um, a nonce which satisfies the, the, this proof of work requirements, you get rewarded financially with these bitcoins, which uh, empirically have, have value. So one, one bitcoin is about a thousand pounds right now, and every, every block generates 12 and a half bitcoins. So you stand to win 12 and a half thousand pounds by finding one of these nonces, and, but it's only valid if yeah, your nonce core is, is, is actually included in the canonical um, branch of, of this tree. Um, does that make sense? Cool. Good. So well, if you have a huge amount of compute power, just come up tomorrow and completely reverse all of this tree, like if they said, oh yeah, I've been working secretly on this bridge. Uh -huh, yes. Um, so the question is, can someone secretly do lots of work and then publish it um, in such a way w that the work I uh, overpowers the network and, and reversing a large uh, part of history? And the answer is, is yes. Um, and that's as a name is called the 51% attack. So if, if someone has more than 50% of the, the, the mining power, they could do such an attack. The underlying premise is that this is an open network where anyone is open to compete and, and, and mine. And that the, 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 the mining power is, is, is distributed. <coughs> so it will be very difficult and costly for a single attacker to, to pull that off. To give you um, an idea, right now about $1 million of electricity is burnt every day to secure the Bitcoin network. So if you want to overpower the, net the network, you need to spend at least a $1 million. Um, the other thing you need to do is to, you need to buy this um, sophisticated hardware which will mine Bitcoin. Um, so just to give you a bit of historical perspective. So from the point of view of a miner, you want to you wanna minimize your, um, the, the cost per, in, in joules per, per hash that you're making. And initially, people were mining with CPUs. And then they started getting more and more specialized. So they went to GPUs and uh, wrote special pieces of software to mine there. And then um, they moved on to FPGAs, and now we have ASICs, like specialized uh, pieces, uh, chips that will mine with a very high efficiency. And, and now within the ASIC space, you know, we're seeing uh, better and better processes so that the efficiency um, increases. So it's, it's quite a difficult uh, task um, to, to, and it has never happened in the, in the eight years of, of Bitcoin. Okay, any other question? Okay. So that's the foundations of um, Bitcoin. And the, the next layer is um, the state layer. And this is where Ethereum really shines. It's, it's taken the proof of concept, which was Bitcoin, where the, the only permissible state changes is related to this, this reward in Bitcoin. So the only permissible state change is along the lines of you know, s send this amount of Bitcoin to, to this address. Um, and what Ethereum has, has said is, well, hold on. Um, we can actually have any kind of state change that we want. So we can have a Turing complete virtual machine <laughs> which um, has arbitrary state and arbitrary state, transaction, um, tra state transitions. Um, and we can, we can do that on, on, on the blockchain. And so one way to think of, of, of Bitcoin is kind of, or at least this, 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 this blockchain, is um, as Um, as, a, as, as a piece of software that behaves like time. So time has three major components, right? It has a past, a present, and a future. 
and the key property of, of the past is that it's immutable. Once it happens, you can't change it. You can't go back in time. The key property of the present is that it's a shared common. Like everyone um, is part of it and, and participates in it according to their free will. And the property of the future is that it's, it's bound to happen. You, you, you can't stop it. Um, and so when you combine this consensus layer, which looks like time, with the state layer, which is nothing more than a computer, you, you get for the first time in history uh, a computer with a, with a native concept of time, um, which, is, which is very, very powerful. So to go into slightly more details about the state machine, um, it's a Turing complete machine based with opcodes. They have 118 opcodes. And the way that um, access to this blockchain is, is regulated is um, using these um, addresses. So, whoops. So the first piece of cryptography that's used in, in the blockchain space is hashes, cryptographic hashes. The second piece is um, cryptographic signatures. So you can claim an address, um, which is yours, and you can store any kind of arbitrary um, code, which is a, c a concatenation of opcodes and arbitrary storage. And whenever you want to make a state change, you write this little message saying, I want to make this state change, and you sign it um, with, your, with your private key, and you broadcast it to the network on this, on this mesh network. And all the miners, those who are processing the transactions and um, making sure that time progresses, um, will I include your transaction. So one of the things that um, exists in Bitcoin, but is especially relevant for Ethereum, is this um, concept of, of gas, or in Bitcoin it's called transaction fees. And it's basically um, an open auction system, which um, is there to... Um, to be a market solution for this, the scarcity of space on this blockchain. So one of the properties of this blockchain is that every participant in this blockchain, at least those who are securing the network, need to have a full copy of the transactions that have happened. And so um, this puts a limit effectively on the processing, processing power of this computer to um, to, the, to the lowest common denominator, which is just one, one computer. So, so um, you know, the whole world has to share what roughly corresponds to the processing power of a mobile phone. Um, and so for this, to, to be fair, there's, a, there's a, a gas system whereby every computational, computational step or every byte of storage that you use on this computer, you have to pay for. And you kind of pay for pro rata to how much you use. Um, so that's, that's the gas. And then there's also what's called the gas price. And this is where the open auction comes in. Like the highest bidder, the, the, those who are um, happy to pay the most to be included in the blockchain um, are the ones who will be. OK. Um, now, another um, big innovation in, in Ethereum is to um, generalize the, uh, what's called Merkle tree in, in this diagram. So the, the Merkle tree is really, really cool because it allows for um, short cryptographic proofs. For um, those devices in the network which don't want to download all the transactions, that have ever happened. Instead, they're only interested in their transactions specifically. So this really significantly lowers the barrier, um, and it even allows, you know, a, a Raspberry Pi or or whatever, a very low power device to um, make full use of, of the blockchain. So the the one of the kind of proofs that you can do in in, in the Bitcoin land is you you take a transaction and you, you, you ask the network, prove to me 
that this transaction has actually been included in the blockchain. <coughs> and the way it works is the, what's called the light client will only have to first download the, uh, the block headers. So the block headers are very small. I think e each of these fields are 32 bytes or along those lines. So we're talking maybe 120 bytes per header, and there's one of these headers every 10 minutes. So it's a very, very small amount of data. They download that, and they can very easily verify the proof of work just by running, doing the, these hashes. So they're, they're kind of convinced that the whole world is agreeing on these Merkle routes. And then someone can provide a proof which says, hey, look, um, your, your transaction is part of this block, and you can follow through the path from it to the Merkle root. So if you have a transaction, you hash it, and then you go up the tree, and then you, you kind of hash it with the neighbor. You go up the tree, hash it with the neighbor, and then eventually you'll get to the Merkle root. And if what you calculate actually corresponds to the Merkle root, then you, you guarantee with cryptographic sec um, security that this transaction has indeed been included in, in, in the blockchain. And what um, Ethereum allows you to do is basically um, do the same thing but with arbitrary state. So you can query this database, as it were, and ask, you know, give me a very, very short proof that um, this piece of state is stored for this account, for example. And it, and it can do that, and that's fantastic. And one of the main innovations is, is what's called a Patricia Merkle tree. And the main property is that it um, behaves optimally from a um, complexity theory standpoint. It does um, logarithmic inserts, deletes lookups, and proof size and proof validation. So it's like the best you can ever do. Um, so, so that's Ethereum. It's the, uh, a, a universal state machine living in the blockchain. Any questions? What's N in this situation? N. Um, OK, um, so it depends on the context, um, but it's basically the, the number of keys in this key, in this tree, sorry. So the trees correspond to, to key value. Um, they encode um, uh, a mapping of keys to values. And so, for example, in for if, if you're talking about transactions, that's the number of transactions. If you're talking about um, state, it would be the number of addresses. If you're talking about uh, receipts, which are state changes, um, that would be the number of state changes, etc. So the, the number of those in all, in, in all time? Okay, good question. So um, it depends. So for state, it's since the beginning of time. For transactions, it's the transactions for this one block. And same for receipts. It, it would be only the state changes for this one block. Um, so what Bitcoin does is, is that they only have um, the transactions for this one block. Um, Ethereum have um, the state thing, which is from the beginning of time. But it's... It's not all the state transitions. It's the it's the snapshot of the current full state machine. Yeah. So you've got this gas price. Does this mean there's going to be a kind of endless backlog of uh, calculations requested for, for which the price that's supplied is too low for like the one global mobile phone equivalent processor that's running this? Um, in theory, yes, but not in practice. Um, what, we s what we're seeing in practice right now is that there's much more um, supply than there is demand. In the case of Bitcoin, things um, are different. Bitcoin has a one megabyte cap on the blocks, um, and there's one block every 10 minutes. So that puts an effective limit in terms of number of transactions per second to um, 3.5 transactions per second. 
which is very uh, small amounts of transactions. And um, this limit, which is an artificial limit set in the, in the Bitcoin protocol, is, uh, is hit now. And so we're seeing the, um, the transactions fees skyrocket. They used to be less than a penny, and now they're over a dollar um, per transaction. And in the case of Ethereum, um, there's a bunch of, of improvements compared to, to, to Bitcoin. Um, one is that they have dynamic block sizes to adjust with demand. But uh, you still basically need one, like the, the slowest possible client needs to be able to do the calculations required by everybody worldwide real time, right? So this, this doesn't grow beyond the kind yes. of processing power that's required Effectively, you've got one supercomputer worldwide that is only as powerful as the slowest device. That's exactly it. Um, and that's a huge problem in the, in the space of blockchains in general. Uh, the good news is that um, some of the smartest people are working on this problem, and there's various possible solutions. Um, one possible solution is uh, what's called sharding, uh, which is to have um, these parallel blockchains which are um, kind of united through um, some fancy cryptography. Another um, really cool way to scale is what's called state channels. So um, I'll give you the simplest example of a state channel, which is a payment channel. A payment channel is uh, basically um, a, a way for two counterparties to put down collateral on, on some blockchain and um, allow for arbitrary payments to happen um, between these two counterparties up to the limit of the collateral that's been put down um, in such a way where if there's any kind of dispute that happens at any point in time the two parties can go to the blockchain and, and settle the dispute. Um, so, for example, we can set up a state channel where you have one Bitcoin as collateral and I have one Bitcoin as collateral. And let's say um, every day I, I pay you a tenth of a Bitcoin, but suddenly one day you give me a refund of, of half a Bitcoin. Um, that's all fine, we can do it what's called off-chain outside of the Bitcoin blockchain. And when we want to close the channel, well, we kind of add up all, the, all these off-chain transactions and settle them on the blockchain. So you can take an arbitrary number of transactions, which are made off-chain, and kind of collapse them to just two. One, opening the channel, and two, closing the channel on the, on the main chain. But people are doing um, pretty awesome um, state channels. So just to give you a concrete example that's easy to understand is like um, a casino. Like you have what are called smart contracts. So these pieces of code are known as smart contracts. They're not smart, they're just pieces of code. Um, and you know, people are building smart contracts which replicates the functions of a casino. Um, so but the, the thing is that there's no actual operator of the casino. It's all directly peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so in, in particular, the, there's, there's minimal or, or, or no uh, fees to participate. And so you can imagine participants say, OK, today I want to gamble, I don't know, let's say 1,000 pounds. And then um, so there's a collateral of 1,000 pounds, which is put on the, on the blockchain. And then they do all, these, all this gambling with the casino, and then at the end of the day, you know, he's left with 500 pounds, or he's made half a million, and um, the, it can be settled um, on, on, on the blockchain. <coughs> cool. Um, so the next layer is storage. Um, and 
one way to summarize IPFS is to say that they've taken a uh, content addressing model as opposed to a location-based addressing model of the World Wide Web. So if you want, if you want to download um, an image from, from, from a specific website, what you'd have is you'd have the domain name and you'd have slash the path of the image and then the name of the image dot the extension and then um, you know based on that specific location on the internet this specific server um, you know the HTTP request will be interpreted as okay please deliver this this image what IPFS is doing is saying that actually this is completely crazy we shouldn't be um, asking specific locations for things, we should be asking for the content directly. So what they do is they, um, they take a, uh, any file that you, you, you give it and they'll, they'll chunk it into pieces and they'll, they'll build a Merkle tree similar to um, what we've seen previously. So every block corresponds to a leaf of the tree and then they kind of subsume it all the way to, to a root. And this Merkle root corresponds as the unique fingerprint for this file. <coughs> so if you want to download a file, you say, hey, um, decentralized network, I'm interested in downloading this file as identified by this hash. And then um, the, the network will say, OK, well, this person has this piece and this person has this piece. All the downloads can happen in parallel and then each piece can be verified for cryptographic identity um, integrity because you have the, 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 the tree of hashes um, and you can download it from anywhere in the world including your, your local network so so in that sense you can kind of um, beat the speed of light so traditionally if you want to let's say you want to download a YouTube video you have to go all the way to YouTube let's say to, to London and um, the servers in London and let's say the servers are London and down, so you, you go all the way to, to Frankfurt. And but that, that's crazy, you have yeah, millions of people watching, I don't know, Lady Gaga, and they're all downloading and all going to, to London or Frankfurt. Um, what if you could just download the, the video from um, your, the closest person who, who has it, which may be you know, in the Redgate office? Um, and that's fine, IPFS allows you to do that. Um, so you, you're, you're able to have any untrusted peer as provider of content. Um, so this is actually how BitTorrent works uh, on, under the hood. You know, they, they cut the these big movies into lots of small pieces. They build this tree and then they advertise these magnet links in a DHT. And this is exactly what IPFS does. But they've just done it so much better. Um, and actually, IPFS is super ambitious. They want to effectively rebuild the underlying um, World Wide Web. Um, and um, it kind of reflects in their name. IP stands for Interplanetary um, <laughs> File System. Um, yeah, so you have, so one of the cool applications, for example, is um, in deduplication where you know, you, 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 you're, you're browsing all these websites and they all have the same files, you know, they all have jQuery, they all have bootstrap icons or, or whatever, font awesome, and they all have, it, and it's kind of stupid that, uh, because in theory the servers could just um, give you an arbitrary file in request for, for this location that you specified, um, that you can't do deduplication. Um, de but when you have uh, content, content addressing, you don't have to, to do all this wasteful downloading of content. It's also cool because applications such as OpenBazaar um, can run in a totally distributed fashion. You have the storage layer which with no like cent central servers. So it's effectively run by the community um, and in, in most cases, well, right now, the only uh, use cases are completely disincentivized in the sense that um, the community will just provide the, 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 the computing resources uh, for free, you know, using the, the, their own hardware, very similar to BitTorrent. You know, no one's um, incentivizing the, the seeders of content. 
but IPFS is going to introduce an incentivization layer for um, unpopular files. So if you have files which you only care, so for example, files that you've encrypted and, and you are the only one who has the decryption key, um, so personal files, you'll be able to incentivize the, the network to actually store them on your behalf. Any questions? Yes? no central point of failure, then how do you find out the hash? If you ask the network for that, like the hash of the content you want? Okay. Um, so, so one, one of the questions that arises, so, so how do you find the hashes? Um, so you, it's very easy to find hashes once you know kind of previous hashes. So, for example, you know, you go on a web page and it has links to, to, to other pages, and that would in themselves be, be, be hashes. But one of the questions could be, okay, how do you, at the very beginning, how do you get your very first hash? And it's kind of similar to the, the way that DNS works. So, you know, if you want, um, if, if you want let's say, the, the latest IP address of, the, of one of the Google servers, you would just make a, a DNS query and you just have to remember google.com but not the actual IP addresses, um, which would correspond to the, to the hash in, in this um, analogy. And so IPFS has um, a layer called IPNS, the Interplanetary um, Name System. And the idea there is to have mutable links from a fixed hash to a mutable hash. So normally all these links um, between data structures are immutable because they're all based on on um, on these cryptographic um, hashes which are extremely rigid um, but they also have a, an, a mutable layer um, and then you can couple that with actual DNS or or any other naming system so for example on, on Bitcoin we have uh, a naming system called um, Blockstack and what Blockstack does, it uses the Bitcoin blockchain as a mapping between human readable names um, and machine readable blobs of data. So you could have, um, you could use Blockstack coupled with IPNS or, or DNS even coupled with IPNS. Yeah? Doesn't this <coughs> lead to either everything has to redirect by one of these mutable links or a massive cache invalidation problem. So in other words, if I think of like our website, or typical company website, it's sort of this page links to that page, which links to that page. I know I want to update one page because we've changed the price of the product. That's obviously going to change the hash of that page, which means that every page that links to it has to change hash or in redirect by one of these IPMS links, which means everything that links to that Changes yeah. hash, and particularly when you have circular links. Okay, yeah. Um, so in the immutable case, you can't have um, circular links by definition, um, because you know that would be in finding a, a collision in, in, in the hash function. Uh, but you're right that I imagine that m most websites will still use the immutable versions. Um, sorry, the mutable versions. So you'll be able to have to point to the latest version of something. I think it will be more the, um, the underlying uh, nitty gritty um, of websites which will be kind of abstracted away from the end user which will use um, these mutable versions. But effectively you can only use immutable links for things which do not themselves contain links or which themselves only contain links to, uh, only contain mutable links. Uh, you know, it's right, like an image. Yeah, yeah. So in effect, you can only use this for, you can only immutably link to leaflets in the tree. Um. Because like, mo most web pages link to like navigation mm -hmm. systems. Yeah, I th I think you have uh, like kind of strictly more power than you had before in the sense that um, you could do everything mutably if if you if you want. Um, but you, you can now also have the option to do things um, immutably. Um, I mean, in the case of, of um, updating a, um, a, a website, let's say you're only changing uh, like 1% uh, of your website, 
Um, the one of the cool things here is that most of the files would stay the, the same, and so um, you'd be able to do very clever, um, from a caching perspective, you'd be able to do very clever logic so that you only um, have the diff. Um, I mean, in, in a way, you can think of, of IPFS as kind of a fancy Git. Um, and so, sure, um, like you, you, you wouldn't think of, if, as a programmer, you'd say, okay, you know, git pull from something mutable from, let's say, your, your GitHub repository. And, and from a user perspective, that's what you'd only use because it's, you're not a machine, you're human. Um, but at the end of the day, when, it, when Git does the actual diffing and, and clever stuff so that your Git pull is like very, very fast, it will use this fancy technology. So the idea that you get lots of stuff changes, you're only, you're only having to know the differences from the yes. because it was split into lots of blocks. Exactly. Yeah. I just wanted to know, with the distributed storage, what form does the incentivization layer take? Like, how do you incentivize people to host content? Yeah, so um, <coughs> we're starting to see kind of a wave of uh, what are called app tokens, like application-specific tokens, which are tokens which live in some sort of blockchain, and they um, have a, a purpose. So, the perp so I think IPFS is looking to launch what's called Filecoin, and Filecoin is basically um, a fungible token, so it's, it behaves like like money, but it's not actually money, it has a single purpose. And this purpose would be to rent storage space from the network. Um, and so you have a, a, a natural market where those who, who need storage will buy these tokens and those who have storage will, um, will want to provide storage in exchange for the tokens, which they can then sell on the open market for pounds. Um, one of the um, use cases of these application-specific tokens is that also kind of a, a business model or some sort of revenue model for the developers themselves. And that the way this is expressed is using uh, what are called ICOs, initial, initial coin offerings. It's a bit like an IPO, but in this crypto world, where um, the developers say, we will, we will, at time T0, we will produce, let's say, a, a million of these coins, and we will sell them to the market, to speculators, even before the service has been um, delivered. And we will keep a certain percentage, let's say 10%, for ourselves. And so when the, the product is actually delivered, um, they, can, um, they can sell these coins, or even before there's a market before the, the product is delivered, they can just sell them on the market to speculators. Do we have time? Um, we have eight minutes. Um, more questions? Or shall we move to the next layer of the stack? Okay, next layer. So this is one of the things I'm uh, working on. It's called Open Bazaar, and it's um, this peer-to-peer -peer decentralized marketplace. It's eBay without eBay Inc. or Uber without Uber Inc. Airbnb without Airbnb Inc. And so, um, you, because you have an, an, no middlemen um, as, as companies, you, you have um, no fees uh, at the protocol level. So compare that to eBay, which charges 10% charges, uh, from the vendor, and they also charge 3% through PayPal. So that's 13%. Um, you also have um, privacy, which is something rather unique. So in, in the world of e-commerce, you just have to accept the fact that the marketplace operator just knows what you're buying. Um, in the case of Open Bazaar, um, you have end-to-end um, -end encrypted channels from the buyer to the seller. And so only the buyer and the seller know what, what's going on. Um, and an another interesting aspect is, is open innovation. So 
this open bazaar is just a, a, a piece of code that's open source and um, anyone is welcome to to fork it extend it or write services for it and which is which is very different to the the siloed corporate marketplaces where the the where the operator has a monopoly on innovation. So uh, one of the innovators on OpenBazaar is, is my company Duo. Um, and we provide um, a search engine among other things. So at the, at the technical level, um, it uses a bunch of protocols that I've talked about. It uses IPFS, um, specifically like uh, libp2p, for uh, identity and transport, and IPFS for, for the hosting layer. So the, the, as a vendor, let's say you have a bunch of listings with, with images and whatnot. You just tell the network, hey, this is what I'm, list this is what I'm selling, uh, you, you say publicly. And, um, and the participants in this network will host the data for you. So you don't have to be online 24-7. You just hop on and off um, this um, distributed network. The other interesting thing is it uses Bitcoin for uh, payments and dispute resolution. So payments is easy. Um, it's just a normal Bitcoin transaction. The way that dispute resolution works is using escrow contracts. So it specifically uses what's called two of three multi-sig, which is a property, one of the things you can do with Bitcoin. You can have, instead of having a single owner of a piece of Bitcoin where you need a signal, single signature to make a Bitcoin transaction. You have, um, you have three kind of um, owners, as it were, and you can set a threshold whereby you need at least two of these three owners to simultaneously agree to making transactions. <coughs> and so what uh, OpenBazaar has done is said, okay, well, for every purchase or order, we're gonna give one signature for the buyer, one for the vendor, and one for a mutually agreed um, moderator that had been picked from a market of moderators. So OpenBazaar in its current proof of concept stage has about 100 moderators which are online, um, which, it, which the buyers and, and, and seller can agree to choose. And so if there's any kind of dispute, um, the moderator will educate in favor of one of the two parties. Um, after reviewing um, the, the, the evidence. But the moderator is not brought in um, before the dispute. So if there's no dispute, there's no um, dispute fee, and it's uh, completely private between the buyer and the seller. It's only if there's an actual dispute that the moderator comes in and, and they, will, they will charge the fee that they advertised, which is typically around 1%. Um, OpenBazaar also uses Blockstack, which is this alternative to DNS uh, on Bitcoin. So you can just register handles and that will map to your cryptographic identity. And it also uses Tor for privacy. Um, and it also has kind of its... So these are all uh, protocol reuse and it also has its own um, kind of custom protocol, which handles things like um, asynchronous messaging where you could have one party, the sender, which is online, but not the recipient. So um, it, it, it does that using um, the libp2p DHT and the, and the IPFS. Um, it also allows, kind of very clearly states what the purchase flow is, you know, so um, you s the buyer sends in an order, it's confirmed, it's being funded, refunded, um, in dispute, etc., etc. And then it also has um, um, chat and uh, a very primitive uh, reputation system based around ratings. So once the transaction has gone through, the buyer can, can leave a rating. Um, so that's Open Bazaar. Any questions there? Yeah. So you said it has about 100 moderators at the minute. So how much commerce goes on, on this thing at the minute? Um, so the current version of OpenBazaar 1.0 was released about a year ago, and to be frank, it's um, not very usable at all. Um, those who use it are extreme enthusiasts of the platform. Um, there's 
definitely less than 100 transactions per day that's happening. Um, probably closer to you know, 20 transactions per day. But it's hard to know exactly because the transactions happen bilaterally. Um, there's no central kind of server keeping track of what transactions have happened. You kind of need to get clues from various places. Um, but yeah. The second version of OpenBazaar, which is due to, to be launched in a few um, months, is 10 times to 100 times better than the current version. Um, and it's actually all this technology, IPFS and Tor, um, is, is for specifically the, the next version coming up. Um, so we're hoping for a significant uptake of users um, within the Bitcoin community. So the Bitcoin community has about 10 million users and we're hoping OpenBazaar to attract the same number of users that it did initially, which is about 300,000 users. So th there's been 400,000 downloads of, the, of the, the proof of concept version, but most people try it out and it's not good enough for their use. Um, we're expecting a similar um, um, download rate, but hopefully more um, more stickiness. And I think my time's up. Um, but um, I'll just go to the last slide. Um, if you if you do want some uh, to to learn more about this whole space, I'm giving away um, one dollar of my ether. So ether is the equivalent of Bitcoin on Ethereum to anyone who wants to just try it out, um, kind of as a live demo. And you just need to go to, to, or just need to download JAX, which is a piece of software um, to allow you to receive that, that token. So that's it, thank you.